David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It's Tuesday, April 16th, 2024. Time for another day in court for Donald Trump and time for another... <sighs> oh, what? Well, where am I? Oh, yes, I'm in court. Where I always am. Yes, time for another show. Time for another day in court for Donald Trump. The big news of the day, I guess, was that he fell asleep a lot. Uh, but there was jury selection and I don't know whether that really generated that much news per se, but there were lots of reporters there watching and apparently reporters watching him fall asleep during jury selection, which, as many people pointed out, probably the most relatable thing about him ever is that uh, that's very boring. Uh, but he didn't have to be there at all, as Greg reminded us yesterday, but he chose to be there and still fell asleep. And, uh, you know, blah, 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 low energy, whatever, whatever. And, of course, people pointing out the uh, insanity. Had the shoe somehow been on the other foot, I mean, first you'd have to be like, yeah, sure, Joe Biden committed a bazillion crimes as an on, and is on trial in four different jurisdictions simultaneously for trying to overthrow the government. That part is difficult to imagine. But if you did... Uh, of course, imagine the idea of uh, of of Biden. I don't know that his attention be required for anything, and it looked like he falls asleep. Uh, that would be a story uh, for days. Uh, but instead, now, well, there was some observations. Maggie Haberman sending out her notes. I think that's the one that spread it around first. That it looks like he's fallen asleep, and that uh, at some point he jars awake. I think everybody kind of knows that he absolutely farted himself awake, right? We all know that. Uh, we, we remember that this is this is how he behaves, like on the Brad Raffensperger call. You re- and you remember that we have the tape, right? We found a way in other states later. Excuse me. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so that was when he was awake, and he knew what he was doing. Anyway, apparently some notes passed to him, and he jars awake, not because I don't think of the notes being handed to him, or that I don't know whether they poked him or anything, but... Anyway, I guess, and that's it, right? We're going to let Trump be Trump. And if he's sleeping, he's sleeping and you let him sleep. Uh, and apparently he fell asleep a second time later in the afternoon session. Uh, and it was allegedly spotted this time by, the, I think, the Daily Beast's Jose Paglieri, who's there covering the trials. It didn't say in the in the social media post to where I saw it, but it did say that it was the Daily Beast reporter. And I guess whoever was sending this out knew who was there for them. And so a second little nod off nap uh, spotted and then apparently some debate in among the news professionals there covering. Uh, is he really sleeping? Maybe maybe he's just, you know, maybe he's just resting his eyes. That's what my dad used to tell me or my grandparents or whatever, you know, uh, uh, but that they would debate it at all. It seems a little bit silly. The, yeah, he fell asleep in court. And it's not that big of a deal either, but of course, for Trump, who goes around accusing everybody else of being low energy and falling asleep, et cetera, et cetera, it should be a thing. And it was. Everybody celebrated it and had a good time. Uh, Although then uh, the people came to rain on the parade. We're having a fun time uh, making fun of Donald Trump falling asleep in his own criminal trial. The first United States president, former president, to fall asleep at his own criminal trial, by the way, Record-breaking sleeping happening inside of this trial, only because it's me. And anyway, they come for Trump. The Sandman comes for Trump. He puts the sand in the eyes. And I guess maybe, yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think of how, what would he regard the Sandman as doing? I mean, it's a pretty straightforward name. So, okay, he probably wouldn't screw that one. A man, person, woman, sand, TV camera, pillow. My pillow. They're all my pillows, actually. Anyway... You get the idea. He fell asleep. Everybody talked about it. Uh, and then people came to say, don't talk about Trump falling asleep. He wants you to focus on that so that you don't focus on, you know, whatever. The, the fact that he's on trial. He fell asleep in a courtroom. I haven't lost sight of that. And the trial hasn't started yet. So I'm not too worried about that. Uh, and he'll do much more to uh, make it worse, I'm sure. Oh, other uh, other theories circulating. And I kind of like this one that... Maybe they sort of drugged him up a little bit to say, uh, let's make sure that the boss stays 
relatively calm and quiet today because apparently the first couple uh, social media dispatches were that he was biting his lip during the voir dire portion of jury selection, which is the whole damn thing. Anyway, uh, not clear whether that was supposed to be him restraining himself or he just likes the taste of lips, uh, possibly, which is why he goes around trying to steal the taste off of other people's faces all the time uh, or, or what. But anyway, the idea was maybe he's uh, tense and upset and was likely to explode. So they said, uh, take a little relaxant here and, uh, and maybe it did its job too well. But pretty soon he'll be back to yelling and screaming or muttering at people. Uh, a very weird courtroom sketch of him circulating the other day of him trying to, I guess he was instructed, why don't you turn to the jury pool and smile, show them you're a friendly guy. And he gave this wackadoodle grimace that others pointed out. Looks like the the, the, the smile that crosses the Grinch's face when he comes up with the plan to, uh, you know, to raid Whoville, to, to mount an insurrection, essentially, against Whoville. Uh, we'll be wild. <laughs> we'll steal your Christmas tree. We'll be wild. Anyway, uh, so very weird. And uh, I'm wondering why the courtroom sketch artist didn't feel free to put little wavy, you know, sickly green stink lines emanating from his body. But still no word on whether those inside the courtroom can confirm how horrible he smells. I imagine they shower him up and try to put him in fresh undergarments or whatever it is that's causing this problem allegedly so that he's uh, uh presents his best i don't know anyway the the trial continues we wait for the hot spots to show up there's a nice preview somebody uh was circulating saying what to expect when we get to the stormy daniels portion of our uh entertainment our bread and circuses for the month uh, we could read about that. Let's see. Oh, other uh, proceedings were one uh, Trump's team tried to um, secure him the right. Remember, he's got to be in court. He's got to be in court for the actual trial portion. Didn't have to be present for jury selection, but chose to be and is already trying to uh, work things out with the judge and beg the judge for leave to be away once in a while. Uh, the court does not meet on Wednesdays. Oh, and uh, I think yesterday Mighty OCD might have tried to slip me a note about why that was. Greg and I, of course, just assumed that he likes uh, that's Wednesday is golf with the doctors. So that's why the judge wants to be away. And I think it's important to point out Oh, well, first of all, it's important to point out that we don't know whether Mighty OCD is lying his ass off about this, but he probably read this somewhere and uh, felt justified in pointing out that it's a lot nicer. It's a lot, lot nicer than you thought. Uh, you thought he was going to play golf. But I guess the judge does community service on Wednesdays and therefore does not hold court, so to speak, uh, in on, on Wednesdays. Um, which is odd because I can't believe the judge has been sentenced to community service that uh, he has to go on Wednesdays and pick up trash alongside the highway. That's that's probably not it. But anyway, uh, that's the reason for the Wednesday absence is a, a nice one. And judges will, uh, you know, set their own schedules. Uh, so Trump has tried to schedule his campaign events for Wednesdays, I guess, as a result and he was very, his team was very proud of telling the judge that they were trying to comply with the schedule. But could they also make sure that he didn't have to be in court on the date of Barron's graduation? I guess we're at that point now. And uh, Barron is uh, like seven foot nine and graduating from college, not college, from high school. And uh, it's terrific. He's very tall. Uh, I hope he's a terrific kid. I mean, he's entering the stage where I guess he's going to be 18 soon. I don't know whether people think that makes him fair game or anything, but I don't know. Uh, what a disaster having to grow up there, but maybe he loved it. So whatever, you don't want to pick on him too much. Anyway, he's graduating from high school. We say congratulations about that, I guess. Uh, no reason not to. And Trump wanted to go, well, Trump allegedly wanted to go to the graduation. I think most people thought there's no way he's going to that graduation, but it's a publicity thing. It makes it look like he cares about his kids, so he might want to go. But the judge was saying, well, you know, uh, no, <laughs> you are a criminal defendant in a 
New York court of law, and the law requires your presence for the trial, and you will be present. I don't know that they can't. I, certainly with another defendant, it might be the case. They might say, well, you know, we can schedule an additional day away from the courtroom or use those, that day for motions work that you don't have to be present for. The jury is out, etc." cetera. Uh, and it may yet happen. I don't think he ruled on it, but the, the judge was pretty stern in saying, you know, look, you're a defendant in court. Yeah, got to be here. There was also some requests. Can I, I want to be also, I mean, maybe it had to do with the volume of requests. In addition to going to see Barron graduate, allegedly. I mean, I don't remember how old Barron is. Anyway, uh, he also said, I want to also not have any courtroom proceedings on certain dates. And it was it this week, next week, I want to go uh, observe the Supreme Court arguments about my latest, you know, wackadoodle. And it's my uh, answer for saying something I'm going to have That's to bleep bullshit. like that. But my motions before the Supreme Court on uh, absolute presidential immunity plus free pizzas motion, whatever it is that he's making this time around. And I want to go observe that. And the judge said, uh, no, that actually, you're not required to be there for that, but you are required to be here for this. And how shall I reconcile those two things? Be here. That's it. And uh, anyway, so Trump took from that. Uh, he's not letting me go to my own son's graduation. And he's weeping and wailing on social media about that. I thought that was an interesting and revealing moment. Who's going to tell, who's going to help me explain to my son why I can't go to his wonderful, beautiful graduation we've been planning for so many years, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, trying to make himself out as the martyr being persecuted by this judge. But I mean, right up top, the first question, who's going to help me explain to my son? You could do it. What, what do you need help for? Explain it to your son. And the, that tells you everything you need to know. He's not going to be the one to explain anything to his son. He barely sees the kid, probably. And uh, somebody else should take responsibility for explaining to my son. And they're not cutting your tongue out, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and you're not under a gag order about talking to your son. And you're not going to be in prison either. You're going to be home. You explain it to your son. But it's supposed to be like, I've been thrown in the, I'm, I'm in the hole. I'm in solitary confinement. Who's going to explain to my son? Well, in that case, how about his mom? I mean, does have parents, right? Somebody else could actually explain it. But it could also be you. But that would never occur to you. And that's sort of the weird subtext of that that I didn't see anybody else really actually taking a look at. Well, why aren't you explaining it to your son? Besides which, you don't have to. Uh, so, you know, it's been a weird 24 hours or so. So let's see other things that have happened. By the way, another courtroom situation that I don't know that there's been any writing about it yet because it happened late at night and I should check the news. I don't know whether anybody hustled something out overnight, but hmm. Oh, yeah. OK, well, we do have a report since we've been reading the Daily Beast on all of this stuff all the time. Um, we could take a look. At, is it, did Paglieri write this one? Yes, plus A.J. McDougal, both in on this one. Uh, Trump work, did some additional work on his bond last night, or rather, you know, he had his attorneys do some additional work on his bond. And uh, so there are some developments on that front. Um, oh, let's see. Oh, and by the way, Scott sends me this Notice, Trump did not attend the high school graduations of Don Jr., Ivanka, Eric, or Tiffany. Until he went on trial, he had no plans to attend Barron's graduation either. So, you know, that could be the case. This comes through from Twitter. I don't know what the source is on that. Uh, let me see if I can click through and and see anything about that. Um, no, maybe not. But uh, it sounds truthy. And I'd be willing to believe it, considering his track record. So uh, that wouldn't surprise me in the least. Uh, where were we? Oh, yes, right. So there was some bond action. Uh, as it turns out, we let's see, we left it the other day saying, yeah, we have to wait until April 22nd for a hearing before Justice Engeron about what's going to happen with this bond. And it was kind of disappointing 
that they didn't just say, I don't understand. Why are we even debating this thing? This, the, the paper that they gave doesn't promise to pay anything. They're not secured for the that sort of uh, financing. They're not licensed to do this business in New York. Uh, why aren't they just saying the bond deadline is come and gone? It's time to start forfeiting properties and let Letitia James start the seizures. And why wait until April 22nd? And as it turns out, April 22nd is starting to shape up like it's going to be about some other aspect of things because apparently uh, those who were watching it more closely spent last night saying, by the way, yesterday, April 15th, like at midnight, was going to be the deadline for actually filing something that looked like a bond again. And... Point somebody pointed out, you know, there's like two hours left for uh, for Knight and their attorneys to file something new to try to shore up their claim that they're posting bond for Trump. And sure enough, just before the deadline, something got filed. They put something through and it, too, involved lots and lots of pages of papers with signatures on them and all sorts of things, plus some uh, a good dose of really dry legalese designed to make the eyes glaze over and people lose their place while they were reading and fall asleep like Trump did in court and not know what was going on. But file they did uh, right at the deadline. And, and guess what? You'll never guess. There's stuff wrong with this paperwork too. But the deadline has now come and gone, and now they'll probably be back asking the judge, oh, mistakes, really? Um, maybe you should give us some extra time to correct that. In other words, this is the Jared uh, Kushner security clearance, or not just not security clearance, but financial disclosure problem. Uh, you just keep filing wrong financial disclosures, getting caught, and then saying, I need to fix it give me an extension, and then fixing some percentage of what was wrong out there or finding some excuse for it anyway, and then reissuing it. And, oh, it's wrong again? Okay, give me another six months, 10 days, whatever it was he was asking for. Uh, anyway, so allegedly another batch of paperwork filed in which Knight makes the argument that, well, interestingly, they make the argument that they are in fact listed with that Elani uh, list, the New York list of of out-of-state, acceptable out-of-state, outside, what what do they call it? I can't remember, the lines uh, of, not lines of credit, but uh, you can issue policies across state lines, and I can't remember the the acronym now, but this will probably come up in reading about it, but they, they said, oh no, we, we did make application back in, I think they said June of 2021, they were approved under this. And it's interesting because all the reporters that looked at it earlier said, we can't find your name anywhere. And also that it's okay that their real financial backing is from their parent company and not the one issuing the bond. And they make a very strident filing saying everybody misunderstands. Everybody reads the law backwards and upside down. We're the ones that understand this thing and you're completely wrong about this. And most of the attorneys who reviewed it last night said, I don't I don't get it. I don't don't see why they think that their interpretation is correct. It's just plainly not and still isn't. Uh, And I certainly saw nothing that addressed the fact that the original filing did not make any promises at all on behalf of Knight to pay on uh, default or uh, loss on the appeal, which is kind of, I thought, what constitutes a bond. Now, granted, it's not my area of practice. Nothing is my area of practice, but... uh, I, I, you know, and it may be that people who do this day in and day out know that, oh, yeah, it, it, a validly issued bond does actually read on its face like that. Like, well, the, the the plaintiff or rather in this case, the defendant will pay in case of the loss of the appeal or whatever else. Uh, we're the ones that will first fork over the money, but then that's a private matter between us and the insured here, the bonded uh, and we'll try and recover. It'll be our job to recover from Trump, not the states. But 
I don't know why it would be worded that way, and I haven't seen anybody step forward and say, yeah, it always looks like that they're saying that the defendant will pay. But in reality, everybody understands that to mean that the bond issuer will pay and then recover from the defendant. And the defendant does eventually pay, I guess, if in a, in a valid bond. Uh, so maybe that's that was enough for them. But nobody came forward and said that, and there was nothing that changed the paperwork or amended the paperwork to say that it was Knight assuming this liability which I found interesting and like, well, that doesn't cure the problem, does it? Uh, but no one, I don't know, not many people talking about that aspect. So it begins to worry me. Do I misunderstand? Do I not know something? But still, uh, none of the people who seem to be speaking about it from an expert's point of view are talking about that. And I don't really know why. Uh, on the other hand, uh, our uh, social media pal, uh, Southpaw, did see something. I got to kind of scroll back a little bit and see. And it, it, it brings us back to Trump and paperwork, man. But uh, Southpaw, NYC Southpaw, pointing out, took me about 10 seconds from opening the account security agreement. Uh, and in this case, what was filed, in addition to legal arguments, was a long recitation that looks on its face like a legally binding document that purported, always, to uh, be the instrument by which Donald Trump Jr., as trustee of, uh, of a, a Trump trust of some kind, the Donald J. Trump Irrevocable Trust, which worries me every time something is irrevocable, but we signed it over to you. Uh, hmm. Well, all right. I mean, maybe that could work. Anyway, this was a document purporting to sign over rights to control, access, and presumably drain an account with Charles Schwab, I think, uh, owned by or controlled by, directed by Donald Trump Jr., and that $175 million plus some extra change, about 340000 or so on top of it, was deposited in this Schwab account. When? I don't know, but it was present and it was guaranteed to be present and they guaranteed that they would never let it get below that number and that control in the case of default or loss of the appeal or whatever would normally trigger the bond meant that Knight would gain control of that account and that there was allegedly $175 million, give or take 340000 on top in cash on this thing, which of course leads to questions. If there was $175 million in cash somewhere, why not just either directly put it up as a bond with the court or give it to Knight and say, here, hold it in escrow as security against this bond. Why the idea of having an account somewhere and signing it over? I mean, if you're making the transfer, why not just make a wire transfer that doesn't even require all of this gobbledygook to go with it? Uh, but it's the sort of thing that business types frequently do because there's various advantages to it or maybe it's an interest-bearing account and they get to pocket the interest while it sits there as opposed to allowing Knight to pocket the interest while it sits there. I don't know. Uh, $175 million is the value of the bond. So $175 million plus 340 doesn't seem like enough of, I mean, when, uh, when Don Hankey said they charged very little as a premium for providing the bond, uh, one to 2% was industry standard. Why, uh, it's not more in the neighborhood of, uh, $1.75 million at a minimum. I don't know. $340,000 is the, the fee? That's it? Maybe the fee was paid elsewhere, but what accounts for the extra $340,000? I don't know. Anyway, this paper purports to turn things over to Knight. And Southpaw says, it took me about 10 seconds from opening the security account agreement to find a significant drafting error. Wow, can't believe it. Uh, probably calls for uh, probably calls for a sad trombone, but I wondered whether uh, maybe it's <laughs> something more like well, what know, the hell is supposed yeah. to do, you moron? I don't know. You're supposed to execute this agreement correctly, but anyway, uh, a significant drafting error, which makes the signature page look 
like it belongs to a different agreement. In other words, as he puts here parenthetically, uh, Trump Jr.'s attestation identifies the wrong secured party. Uh, he includes some screen caps here. And yeah, down at the bottom here where it's being, it's signed by uh, Donald Trump Jr. And witnessed, interestingly, there's a witness, it's Jason Miller. And I wonder whether it's a uh, roofie guy and or abortion pill guy, Jason Miller, the scum of the earth, probably. Who else would be witness to this? And then, uh, so down at the bottom is this signature page and they faxed it to the court and everything and filed it last night at 10 o'clock p.m. And here's the thing, down under the signatures, uh, there's also another block signed by Donald Trump Jr. basically saying, uh, yes, I attest that I did in fact sign this thing, which is interesting. I, I, I don't know why you need that, but it says, I hereby certify that I am the duly elected and qualified trustee of the Donald J. Trump revocable trust. Oh, it's the revocable one, not the irrevocable one. Well, that solves that problem. Uh, that is to say the pledge or, and I am the one that entered into the foregoing collateral account pledge and security agreement with Knight, right? Now, what if I told you it didn't say Knight, Knight uh, Insurance or Knight Specialty Insurance or Knight Insurance Limited or any Knight anything, but rather with Federal Insurance Company? Why does it say that? Well, they're not, of course, in any pledge agreement with Federal Insurance Company for this particular transaction. However, others have pointed out Federal Insurance Company is the company that provided the bond in the E. Jean Carroll case. Did they just cut and paste? Don't know. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrox at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything. But if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We should probably get over to the authoritative sources, or at least the re reportorial uh, sources about this. But yeah, in case we faded out during the uh, the the rollout to the break, uh, yes. Uh, so it looks like the security agreement that uh, Donald Trump Jr. signed uh, in order to give allegedly the the story is supposed to be giving. Knight Insurance, uh, access to a Charles Schwab account that is supposed to have $175 million in cash in it that for some reason Trump just wouldn't give them in order to post the bond. And we can imagine a reason why. Uh, but this agreement is clearly cut and pasted from a previous agreement, the E. Jean Carroll case bond agreement, probably because it names the wrong beneficiary, essentially. It names the wrong insurance company as having been granted access. And that's kind of major. And I mean, it's a dumb flub, but it's the sort of thing that, uh, well, that's why you don't file at 10 p.m. on the deadline date, for one thing. Uh, for another, uh, you know, it's Trump paperwork. So it means you have to go through with a fine tooth comb and check everything and make sure all the people who say their lawyers are lawyers and who were witnesses really are witnesses, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know. But yeah, it still doesn't. There's nothing in it that says anything different about the weird original paper where Knight, you know, says they undertake that if Trump loses the appeal, the defendants will pay which to me still means the original paper. It's a mystery as to what it does do or even what it's supposed to do. 
But as I mentioned to you, uh, let's see, we have this piece somewhere, if I can find my way back to it, from the Daily Beast. And hey, it looks like I can actually read it. Thanks to Arch Pundit, our good friend Arch Pundit, for showing me how to handle these things uh, more smoothly when trying to get them to read on the air. Uh, details of how Trump scored that $175 million bond revealed in court filings. Uh, as I said, uh, not just Jose, but A.J. McDougal on this one. Court documents filed late on Monday night have finally disclosed what the former president had to do to secure a deal with the Knight Specialty Insurance Company, if in fact there is such a deal. We do not really know. And this is designed to keep us guessing and probably buy more time. After weeks of intrigue and oddly vague court filings, documents filed at the last minute on Monday night finally revealed what Donald Trump was forced to give up to score a deal with the Knight Specialty Insurance Company. Documents reveal that the former president was forced to sign away rights to his account at the investment bank Charles Schwab, although it looks like actually Trump Jr. did that, in which he claims to have more than $175 million just to keep the New York Attorney General from snatching his properties in recent weeks after a judge ruled that Trump committed bank fraud. Because he did. And now it's cemented. He did it. The $175 million bond is collateralized by... $175,304,075.95 in cash held in a Charles Schwab account pledged to KSIC and KSIC has the right to exercise control over that account, the company and Trump's lawyers said in a joint memorandum, though at the bottom, for some reason, it says, well, actually, uh, this is an agreement with Federal Insurance Company, though the body of the agreement seems to say that it names Knight. So I think the body of the agreement, as far as the named beneficiary, I think that seems okay. Whether or not the rest of the language is sound or whether the claims hold up, I don't know. And neither does anyone. His eldest son, known as Don Jr., signed off on the deal on behalf of the Donald J. Trump Revocable Trust last month, granting Knight a security interest in the brokerage account. The insurance company now has a, quote, first priority lien and security interest, unquote, on whatever money is stored in that account. The Trump trust will be required to ensure, more or less, that it contains, quote, no less than $175 million in cash or cash equivalents at all times, according to the memorandum, uh, which, of course, would mean that either there's no fee or the fee is being paid elsewhere or what, I don't know. The Schwab account in question appears to be different from another Schwab account that Trump put up as collateral when he secured a $92 million bond through Chubb's federal insurance company in his federal rape defamation case. Well, it does appear to be from another Schwab account, I mean, or it could appear to be. That's what they're saying. I don't know. I haven't verified it myself, but maybe they're right. Does it appear to be from a different account? Maybe. Does it appear that they copied and pasted the agreement that they had with Chubb and just swapped in night insurance most of the time? 95% of the instances they got it right. Uh, that's what it looks like. The filings were in response to challenges from the New York Attorney General's office, which earlier this month called into question Knight's ability to justify the surety of the bond. Defending its financial solvency in the memorandum, the firm characterized itself as a, quote, respected, well-capitalized Delaware domiciled insurer that has long underwritten surety bonds and other types of insurance placed around the country. Based in California, Knight is not licensed to issue surety bonds in New York, nor has it obtained a certificate of qualification from the state's Department of Financial Services, but company officials insisted that that doesn't matter. And I would tell you, it seems to me that in the filing, they insisted that they actually had done that, which is a little bit weird. Maybe we ought to parse through that and find out why it says that. Knight Specialty Insurance Company is not a New York domestic insurer. This is from the pleadings. And New York surplus lines, that's what we were looking for. Surplus lines insurance laws do not regulate the solvency of a non-New York excess lines insurers. Amit Shah, Knight's president, told CBS News. Also at issue, 
There's a New York regulation stating that a company can't issue a bond to a single borrower that constitutes more than 10% of its capital. Knight had admitted in an April 4th filing that it had only $138 million in surplus, taking it well beyond the state's barrier. But Shaw argued to CBS... And in the, it's interesting. It looks like he argued something different to CBS than he did in the, in the pleadings, if you ask me. But Shah argued to CBS that Knight maintains over a billion dollars in equity, a claim at odds with financial statements filed around the time showing that the firm had just $26 million in cash and bank deposits and $483 million in stocks and bonds. Adding to the confusion was the fact that Knight initially failed to provide that data. Ah, what a mystery. Why would they fail to provide that data? Uh, and, you know, really the answer is, well, if you fail to provide the data, then the court will say, you didn't provide the data. And uh, then you say, oh, please give us some time to provide the data. We have the data. And they give you time and then you provide it and it's wrong too. Oh, please give us some time to fix the data. And then you give them time and then that's wrong. Oh, please give us more time. That's I, That's my best guess at what's actually going on here. But... Adding to the confusion, as they say, was the fact that Knight initially failed to provide that data, even though they're supposedly in this business. Among other errors that caused the New York court clerks to order it to refile its bond posting. At this venture, at this venture, with so much at stake, to make these kinds of mistakes, it's almost unthinkable. Oh, I see. This is uh, an attorney for Michael Cohen talking to the Daily Beast at the time. And, of course, he meant at this juncture, but he didn't know that. And he said at this venture, which about this venture, I would say, with so much at stake to make these mistakes is almost unthinkable. That might work. After raising questions about Knight's ability to take on the risk, New York Attorney General Letitia James gave the company and Trump 10 days to prove its financial mettle. And I guess that expired uh, last night at midnight, and this is what they filed in response. Had Knight blown its midnight deadline, James could have begun the process of seizing Trump's assets. But instead, in Monday's court filings, Knight contended that it, quote, independently maintains more than $539 million in assets and $138 million in equity, which is the same as they said before, and has access to more than $2 billion in assets and $1 billion in equity, of which nearly $1 billion is in cash and marketable securities, pursuant to a reinsurance agreement with, we read about this yesterday, Knight's parent company, Knight Insurance Company. Problematic for all the reasons we discussed yesterday. Elsewhere in the filings, the company explained KSIC also has a standing agreement with its parent company, Knight Insurance Company Limited, or KIC, by which KIC reinsures 100% of KSIC's risk. The $175 million bonded issue is adequately secured. Hmm. The $175 million bond staves off the $464 million civil fraud judgment levied against Trump and his co-defendants while they appeal. A hearing on the bond has tentatively been scheduled for April 22nd. Uh, but apparently it's about some different aspect of things, I guess. Although they could bring this stuff up too. And if this round of filings turns out to be inadequate or outright fraudulent, you would think they'd run out of patience. Knight is, of course, owned by Don Hankey, a Golden State billionaire who made his $7.4 billion fortune through subprime loans. His shady business practices were the target of the Trump administration, oddly enough, whose Justice Department sued his financial company after it found it had illegally repossessed 70 cars belonging to service members. But I'm sure this will make this problem go away in any second Trump administration, no matter how formulated Hankey's company, Westlake Financial Services, agreed to pay more than $700,000 to settle the matter. Further legal woes brought by the Justice Department in later years would eventually nose its financial pen penalties north of a million dollars. Though he donated tens of thousands of dollars to Trump's 2016 presidential campaign and has copped the voting for him, Hankey maintains the bond is just business. This is what we at Knight Insurance do, and we're happy to do this for anyone who needs a bond, he told the Associated Press after Trump posted his bond. Which is weird uh, that they didn't have any language ready to go that Donald Trump could just sign that didn't somehow, for some reason, have federal insurance company's name in it. 
Seems weird. Um, what can I tell you? Uh, my guess is he has failed to do this paperwork correctly again and will be caught out on it in the coming hours and we'll have to do it all over again and beg for more time and we'll see whether the judge loses patience and says, no, 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 that's it. The bond is now in default uh, and Letitia James, you can go ahead and seize these properties and you should go ahead and do it. Uh, you know, there's various problems with it, including having divided the ownership of most of these properties among other entities. So it could cause legal problems. Uh, don't know what the resale value of Trump Tower is, but at a minimum, they should be able to, I, I think, seize the penthouse and evict Trump from the top floor of Trump Tower if they wanted to. I think they could probably seize a good portion of the Seven Springs estate, maybe even the Bedminster estate. Uh, I mean, technically, they should be able to go down to Pervalago and foreclose on that too, but I don't know how uh, cooperative Florida will be in all of that because the wackadoodle uh, governor that that uh, allegedly serves the state there uh, will get in the way of that. All right, and, and do whatever he can to run interference. So let's see. Uh, other things I wanted to share with you. Let's see. We could look at the uh, preview of what Business Insider says you can expect when the trial actually gets underway. Trump's hush money trial starts Monday. We know that with routine jury selection, but it will really heat up when Stormy Daniels takes the stand. I don't know if you knew that that was going to happen or expected it to happen. Laura Italiano for Business Insider provides this piece. And, uh, well, let's see what she has to say. Yes, Stormy Daniels will go there. Where? Well, let's see. When she does, as legal experts believe she must, I guess in order to explain the seriousness of the situation, it will be the most dramatic and surreal moment in a historic event that's already dramatic and surreal. The first ever criminal trial, with a nap, I would add, of a former president. Sometime in the next few weeks, Daniels, an exotic dancer, among other things, yes, porn star and adult entertainment entrepreneur in her own right. That is to say, she gets actual, uh, gets a bigger cut of all of it because she's helping with production and distribution, not just uh, showing up for the acting part. You know, uh, what people say. Acting. Yeah, right. That's what it is. Well, anyway, she'll be called to the witness stand in a Manhattan courtroom. Experts predicted under oath and with Donald Trump watching from the defense table, she'll testify that she you know, had sex with the then Apprentice star in 2006 in his Lake Tahoe hotel suite. The daytime drama-worthy tawdriness won't end there. Trump, who has steadfastly denied a sexual encounter and who calls Daniels a horse face, how do you like that, and a liar, is promising to testify. I promise to testify, so I guess he won't, and may well attempt to attack her himself if he thinks his lawyers failed to do an adequate job. I got to say horse face. The defense is going to do their best to discredit every part of the prosecution story, predicted Ron Kuby, a veteran Manhattan defense lawyer, and you didn't need a veteran to do that. But anyway, starting with that foundation and the foundation of the case is that they had sex. So they'll deny it and see where to go from there. What's sex got to do with it? Here's the answer. The Trump hush money trial from a strictly penal code standpoint is a dry disagreement over purportedly cooked books. The indictment alleges 34 Trump organization business records were falsified to hide other crimes, including campaign finance and tax offenses. There's nothing more boring than testimony about business ledger entries, Kuby noted, but prosecutors say Trump's books were cooked for at least or rather for the least of boring of reasons. To hide that $130,000 payment that kept 2016 voters in the dark about what Daniels said happened in that Tahoe hotel. Daniels will have no choice but to talk just a little dirty. Prosecutors will steer her toward the topic during her direct examination as a matter of strategy. I would say PG-13, Kuby predicted of the testimony. The money is called hush money for a reason, said former Manhattan financial crimes prosecutor Diana Florence. Jurors will want to hear about what was being hushed. If you don't, they'll be in the deliberations room and they'll wonder why no one is saying what happened. It would be a distraction, she added. Telling a story is especially important in a case alleging that the hush money took a circuitous route. 
from Trump to Daniels. There were shell companies, a year's worth of phony invoices, a non-disclosure agreement, and secret side letters locked away in safes, prosecutors say. You have to answer the question for the jurors of why Trump, why the then president of the United States would go to such lengths to cover this up, Florence said. How would that testimony go? I imagine the prosecution is going to take her through it in the least salacious way possible, Kuby said. It's in their interest not to make this a spectacle. I think we're going to have references to sex having happened, which is less salacious than descriptions of sex happening. Florence prosecuted scores of cases involving falsified business records before going into private practice. She expects prosecutors will start by walking Daniels through the basics of her biography. Daniels, given name Stephanie Clifford, would be asked to describe growing up in Baton Rouge, starting a career in adult entertainment with exotic dancing gigs at local nightclubs. I am now directing your attention to 2006, the prosecutor might then say. It'll be discreet and tailored just to complete the narrative, which is what we called it, Florence predicted. Did you have a relationship with him? She said the prosecutor might ask. Then she'll say, no, it was just one night. And then you fast forward to 2015 or whatever Florence predicted. So I don't know how, you know, salacious the whole thing's going to be, but uh, this will prepare you for it. You have to put it all out there, at least factually, said the former prosecutor. Uh, I, I added the at least factually. She says you have to put it all out there. She has to explain why she had an agent, why she was trying to sell her story. You got to explain the whole background, not just or just not all of the whole background. Daniels' testimony won't be as graphic as her 60 Minutes interview when she told 22 million viewers that Trump didn't use a condom and it won't be anywhere near as descriptive as in her book, Full Disclosure, where she mentions both Yeti pubes. <laughs> Sorry, warning, everybody. I didn't realize that. And Toad, otherwise known as the mushroom character in Mario Kart. None of that's coming in. Florence said with a laugh of Daniel's hush money testimony. Nobody wants to go there. Although, man, I don't know, for some reason, would Trump do it? I don't know, just to make a circus out of it? He won't like that part, I'm sure. Trump has, uh, and then uh, it's one day wonder, will Trump go bonkers at that point? Trump has had a difficult time remaining quiet while watching a woman testify unpleasantly against him. This has happened just one time before and it didn't go well. That would be in the E. Jean Carroll case where the judge threatened to kick Trump out of the courtroom after he kept muttering at the defense table in a stage whisper so that the jury could hear him. Um, let's see. Anything else to add this time, too? Trump will likely be warned that any outbursts might get him kicked out of the courtroom. He could face contempt of court findings or fines or even a little time in jail if he ignores the judge's orders not to disrupt the trial. Uh, he has, though, very seasoned lawyers... Lawrence says, whom I expect, at least behind closed doors, are going to tell him that any performance is going to hinder your interests here. He thinks he might know better, she added. Trump will very likely demand that his lawyers aggressively cross-examine Daniels, at least for show. Daniels will be up to the task, Kuby predicted. I think she can handle herself. She can handle other people also. So he joked, so heh, I guess so. Last section here, I think. This is interesting. Game on, tiny. Daniels boasts no fear of Trump when he called her horse face and a total con job in tweets in 2018. She won up them. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present your president? She tweeted in response. In addition to his um shortcomings, he has demonstrated his incompetence, hatred of women and lack of self-control on Twitter again. Perhaps and perhaps a penchant for bestiality. That's interesting. Yikes. She tweeted, meaning the horse face thing. Well, you had sex with her. So there you go. Game on, tiny. She taunted from all appearances. She's going to be a witness who's extraordinarily difficult to control on cross cross examination. That is all right. I think we can extract ourselves from this article. We're nearly at the end. But anyway, in case we were wondering whether or not the uh, that's way, one, whether Stormy Daniels would testify, and two, the nature of that testimony. I think it'll be relatively mild. So they're saying about PG-13 is probably the plan from the prosecution. And we'll see what Trump himself does with all of this. All right. Well, let's see. We should be preparing, of course, 
for speaking with Joan McCarter later on today and uh, probably laying the foundation for what's happening in Congress. There was uh, apparently some unusual happenings um, in who knows what, in the consideration of the, for instance, consideration of the FISA renewal legislation. We reported that it had been held up. We reported that at some point during the previous week, the rule was defeated for it and the wackadoodle Republicans were standing in the way. They managed to get around them, it was said, by shortening the renewal from five years, the the, the usual path for these renewals, down to two years, and that had bought them enough votes. But apparently there was a hitch in the program after all. Uh, and by the way, I also happened to see on uh, social media that it is said that Tom Massey has now told a... House Republican conference meeting, a closed meeting, that he's going to co-sponsor the motion to vacate the chair, I guess the one made by a murdery trader Green at some point earlier, though so far nobody moving to recognize it as a privileged motion, so I don't know if it goes anywhere. So just adding that to the mix. Um, but let's take a look at what we have put away here. Uh, Greg had sent me a note yesterday. Uh, oh, I see. I, the uh, Business Insider article bumped this out of uh, pocket. So I got to jump back in there and see if I can find where I bookmarked what uh, Greg had sent us. Was it this? Was it from Twitter? I think so. So we'll click through and see if this is the one uh, no. Okay. This is a, what is this one? Oh, this was about him biting his lip. Oh, okay. Well, I can use that to prove to you that he was in fact reported to have been biting his lip, though that wasn't super exciting or anything, but, uh, I actually, I could probably find it through Skype notes from Greg yesterday. Uh, yes. Chad Pergram tweeting yesterday, the house was to vote tonight. That would have been Monday night, to finalize the FISA bill from Friday. I guess they didn't finish it, and uh, Greg was interested in finding out exactly what was going on. The House will vote to table, well, he says, will vote to table the motion to recommit from Friday. That's usually a formality, but it wasn't on Friday. Um, uh, now, I, I guess I could go through explaining to everybody once again what the motion to recommit was, but that won't be necessary because apparently Ringwis catches him here and says, no, uh, it wasn't the motion to recommit that got hung up. And that's usually offered by the minority. In this case, the Democrats have a sort of a one shot at recommitting the bill to, uh, to committee because you're committing it to a committee and uh, making an amendment, a last minute amendment. Uh, of some kind, but that's often referred to in the abbreviation MTR. But there's another MTR, a motion to uh, reconsider, which is a thing you can do even after passage of the bill. You can move, if you were one of the members who voted on the winning side, whether it's adoption of the bill, passage of the bill or not, you can move to reconsider the bill and that too can, you know, the motion to reconsider it can be tabled. That also is a routine matter and, and very often is taken care of by the rule for consideration of the underlying bill. The special rule from the rules committee will often waive or deem a motion to reconsider to be laid upon the table by the adoption of the rule. For the bill, but I guess that didn't happen this time, and so I guess they're going to have to go back and figure out the motion to reconsider. I guess I should be looking in the news for that one. That I haven't seen written up either. That's a tough one, and it's probably in one of the trade publications, so to speak, from Capitol Hill. Let's see. Uh, motion to reconsider. 
uh, FISA. We'll see whether that brings us up. Uh, let's see. Who's good for this? Roll call? Let's take that one. Oh, they aren't actually covering it. It's News Nation, which I don't know, News Nation. House to vote on FISA bill after procedural delay. The deadline, or the headline, not the deadline, but the headline, looks more on point than the other one, which is really about Senate action anticipated here. Let's take a look. News Nation. Don't know about the provenance of News Nation and who they are, but House to vote on FISA bill after procedural delay. The House overwhelmingly approved the FISA extension on Friday. Members left the floor before a motion to reconsider was made. And opponents, both left and right, say the FBI has a history of abusing FISA. Those are the top bullet points from this piece written by Jorge Ventura uh, and filed on the 14th. House members approved the extension of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act on Friday, but a vocal opponent of the bill's expansion of FISA's limits used a procedural move to block sending it to the Senate, so the House will vote again on Monday. And I think they did, and I think they cleared it, in case you're wondering. But in case you're wondering what was happening, opponents say well, we're complaining about the past abuses about uh, under FISA. And let's see. Uh, oh, well, this is actually more about the substance of their objections than the procedural hiccup here. But let's see if we can find something about that. Hmm. Uh, oh, okay. So uh, Anna, Anna Paulina Luna was one of the opponents here, and she has uh, allegedly substantive objections. But Luna helped engineer the delay after the FISA bill overwhelmingly passed the House on Friday, 273 to 147. She filed a motion to reconsider, I'm usually immediately rejected, but not this time. All right, welcome back now to the K-Grown in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. <sighs> All right, let's see. Um, this really doesn't have that much more to reveal about uh, the situation. So it comes down to this. Um, if you are a C-SPAN watcher, you will probably, well, you're crazy and you should get some help. But if you are, you have heard or, you know, even a, a casual Listener, if you're paying attention to the procedural utterings that follow the adoption of a or, or you know, the passage of a bill, you will hear the uh, presiding officer usually say, uh, "You." They would announce it this way: On this vote, the yeas are 273, the nays are 147. Although now I can't remember whether it's the eyes and the nose or whether the yeas and the nays in terms of actual passage of the bill, but we could look it up. Uh, does this have a number? Oh, well, we, we shouldn't bother looking that up. But if you wanted to know, you would, you could uh, look at the roll call vote over at congress.gov. And now I guess I'm going to take you over there. And uh, let's see. So this was Monday. So if you wanted to look at roll call votes in the House, um, I guess we're in the second session here of the 118th Congress and the most recent votes. Um, what, let's see. We don't want the ones from fr Monday. We want the ones from Friday. And I guess it was this one, Reforming Intelligence and Securing America Act on Passage. It's eyes and nose, so that's the answer. So they would say, on this vote, the eyes are 273, the nose are 147, the bill is passed, and they usually say, and without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid on the table. They might say upon the table if they want to get fancy. So what are you hearing in that one? Without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid on the table. What do you say if you want to have a motion to reconsider? I object. Mr. Speaker, the gentle lady from Florida, Anna Paulina Luna, I think, right, Florida? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I object. Objection is heard, blah, 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 and, and I don't know what you do because ordinarily there is no motion to reconsider. And it is without objection laid upon the table. I don't know if I've actually witnessed i'm sure it's happened but i don't know if it's, i've ever witnessed what happens when an objection is made what do they say 
And probably at that point, uh, they were expecting it and somebody hands a note or if not, they come and stage whisper into the ear of the presiding officer and say, objection is heard. Um, the gentle lady from Florida objects to the, the tabling of the motion to reconsider. Um, but pursuant to rule that, 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 I don't know which one it is offhand. They'll probably announce the chair announces that the House will stand in recess with a vote to, on a motion to reconsider to be held, uh, you know, I don't know whether they actually scheduled it for Monday at that point, but to be held within, there may be a rule about how quickly you have to hold such a vote, but basically then the next utterances would have been about when are we going to schedule such a vote, and the answer is Monday. Then they came back, and on the motion to table the motion to reconsider the eyes were 259 the nose 128 the uh, motion would have been agreed to and the uh, motion to reconsider is now laid upon the table and then they went on to the rest of their business so there was an objection they ask unanimous consent, essentially. Without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid on the table. There was objection. Okay, fine. You object. All right. On the uh, So now there's a motion pending to reconsider the FISA reauthorization bill. At which point on Monday, someone said, Mr. Speaker, the gentleman from, I don't know who, was it Steve Scalise that did it? I don't know. I don't know if it says we could look in the congressional record to find out, but you don't need to know, probably. You don't care that much. And uh, Well, uh, the gentleman from Louisiana, uh, the majority leader, is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I move that the motion to reconsider be laid upon the table at this time. Uh, the motion is on tabling the motion to reconsider. All those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed, no. The record, I demand a recorded vote. Something like that, right? Well, 15 minutes to record their vote. Boom, a gavel, some classical music plays. They vote 259 to 128 to table the motion to reconsider. And guess what? They don't reconsider it. So that's what happened. That was the hiccup. That's why it took until Monday to pass or, or to, to, uh, to be done with the process of passing the bill. They passed the bill on Friday. They moved to reconsider it on Friday. They didn't reconsider it until Monday, at which point they said, you know what, let's just table the reconsideration. Now that that's done, the bill can go to the Senate. But as you know, sometimes they don't send things to the Senate. So we have no idea when they're going to get it over there. That was the subject of some of the other items that uh, were offered to us in the news. And maybe we can back up and See what that has to say. Roll call says that Senate leaders will seek quick action on key surveillance authority because I think the surveillance authority expires at the end of this week. So they have this week to try to get that now finalized bill considered. Did they send it to the Senate? Are they jamming the Senate in some way? Because they're also supposed to today, they're supposed to march over there with the um, Alejandro Mayorkas impeachment resolution. Whether or not they follow up on that, I don't know. Whether or not Murdery Trader Green will be among them, I don't know. Whether she will be wearing something wacky to make a statement, I don't know, but I have a pretty good guess. I uh, don't know exactly what it's going to be, but I have a pretty good guess that she's going to try and do that. Not that they will necessarily have very much to say today. And there may be no opportunity at all to say anything. But they're going to have to deal with that. This is kind of an interesting prospect. Uh, they could So the House could be sending them um, impeachment resolutions that will jam them because their rules will say they really have to deal with this right away in terms of letting the house managers come in and blab at them for some certain amount of time and then possibly moving immediately to dismiss the stuff or just say, well, we'll now swear you in as jurors and tomorrow we'll dispense with the stuff or maybe later on this week we'll dispense with the stuff or they'll have a scheduling resolution. They might have to come up with something, but they might have to put all the dismissal stuff off until next week because 
They'll also be anxiously anticipating this bill that will keep FISA authority alive, and they need to pass that by Friday. So that'll be somewhat urgent. Plus, of course, uh, Ukraine aid, Israel aid, don't forget Taiwan aid, that all these things have to be considered, although the deadline isn't quite as hard and fast as it is with the FISA authority. So that will go first. But at the same time, uh, impeachment being a high priority will probably jam them up. And uh, that's going to busy up their week, which means they won't be able to do anything else. And maybe that's the House plan just to screw with the Senate. All right, let's see. Other things uh, to discuss, there are a couple. here. By the way, in weirdo, wacko news from out of left field, um, last night circulating this on Twitter from uh, Alethea, about whom I know nothing, but still active on Twitter. At any rate, Alethea tweets under the handle of women Two. DC, the two, of course, being the, the Arabic numeral to women to DC, uh, a community organizer and social slash radical justice activist. In case you were wondering, that's how she describes herself. There's more to it, but uh, I don't know if it'll clear anything up. Anyway, uh, breaking news that I guess she witnessed herself and circulated yesterday. Former Republican Congressman Madison Cawthorn, it is alleged, was tailgating me, says Alethea, who uh, and then just rear-ended a Florida state trooper. He's not a great driver, uh, Madison Cawthorn. Uh, Of course, many of you know that he's in a wheelchair and that the reason he's in a wheelchair was automobile accident, uh, although it's unclear whether you know, he says, I think he wasn't driving. There's all kinds of, you know, confusion about who did what in the accident that ended up uh, paralyzing him. But at any rate, eh, he's in a wheelchair and driving again. And Alethea says that she was shook, as they say, by not only his aggressive driving, but then the accident. I was driving, she says, on I-75 South toward Miami in the left lane, and this black-tinted sports car was tailgating me relentlessly. I accelerated ahead and moved to the right lane in front of a tractor-trailer to let the car by. Five minutes later, the highway comes to a complete stop. That is to say, the cars on the highway come to a complete stop. The highway was never moving relative to the cars. However, relative to... Okay, you get the idea. We don't really need to go into all of that, do we? Everything is... uh, quantum physics no um so the cars the traffic comes to a complete stop i swerve to the side so that no one rear ends me you know how it happens when there's an emergency stop on the highway and slow to a halt suddenly the car door opens that is to say the black sports car which is now on the side of the road and i guess wrecked the car door opens and a man in a wheelchair rolls out at the same moment i have to navigate around his car and I look ahead to see the officer exiting from his rear-ended vehicle, holding his neck in the left lane as well. I pulled over to the right shoulder lane and stopped to ask if everyone was okay and to offer assistance. I couldn't believe my eyes. It occurred to me that former Congressman Cawthorn from North Carolina was, uh, I guess, in the black car that stormed by me in an angry road rage tantrum. That's how she's describing it now. I spoke to the cop to see if he was okay, and he was quite stunned and kept reaching for his neck. He said he was okay. Asked if I was a witness. I wasn't. I must have been about 30 seconds behind. And I gave them water as I didn't know what else to do after he thanked me for stopping. But I guess she really was a witness. She was a witness to his aggressive driving technique anyway. As I drove away and replayed the surreal scene in my head, I realized it was the same car who was erratically and aggressively driving behind and then around me. Unbelievably scary and upsetting to see. Happened at about 4.32 p.m., heading south on I-75 towards Miami around the Big Cypress Reservation. Then a bunch of hashtags, but more interesting than that, TikTok video. Whether it was from her or someone else, I am not sure. Oh, I think it is from her, except on TikTok, by the way, she's known as Swifties for Palestine. 
interesting enough. So I guess it's her own TikTok video. There's somebody who certainly looks for all the world like Madison Cawthorn, although a little chonkier, I think, quite honestly. But uh, no, no critique there. That's what happens as we get older, uh, even if it's only a year or two older. Anyway, uh, maybe it was him. So that might be some interesting and wacky news. I thought I would share it with you. And I'm not above telling everybody that it was Madison Cawthorn. If it turns out it wasn't, eh, you'll hear about that later, most likely. Okay, let's see. Other things to uh, bring us up to date on and that might become part of the discussion with Joan McCarter, possibly. Um, let's see. I have this report from Greg Sargent at the New Republic, re- recently resettled there, and we're glad of it. Let's see, by the way. Oh, I also want to make sure that I have some other stuff queued up here. But this... Um, uh, having to do with dynamics in Congress. And so very likely, you know, if not uh, to be directly discussed with Joan, then certainly in the background there. And Greg Sargent has of late pivoted a lot of his content to podcast, which is great for regular podcast listeners. And of course, I love the format myself and I I can see why he would want to do that. Uh, But terrible for me in terms of being able to share content on the air from him because it diminishes, sometimes diminishes his written output. And I don't know if it's really fair game. You can't really, I'm fair game. It's not fair to you. (laughs) It's not fair to him to just play his podcast or even long clips. I guess you could do short clips, but Greg Sargent gets in depth be very difficult to do it in short form to just play his stuff. Anyway, this one's in writing, so we're in luck this time. Uh, Trump's weird moment with Mike Johnson reveals a deeper gop sickness. How do you like that? This is from April 13th. Many prominent Republicans in competitive races are in full thrall to the deranged election denialism that Donald Trump has required of them. And uh, Speaker Johnson has now made a pilgrimage to Pervilago to kiss the ring in much the same way that Kevin McCarthy did post January 6th, which was a really weird and sick turning point for uh, in the demise of the of the Republican Party. And, and, and it's just continuing now, I think, is what the major theme here is. Looking back, Greg begins, it's clear that one of the more fateful moments in the evolution of today's Republican Party came when Kevin McCarthy made his abject pilgrimage to, I say, Pervalago, three weeks after January 6th, 2021. This was, in essence, Donald Trump's public absolution with then GOP leader McCarthy affirming that the Republican Party would make the construction of a monumental historical lie about the insurrection central to its identity for the foreseeable future. And there's an asterisk here, by the way. Uh, Where does he define the meaning of the asterisk? If it's at the end of the article, I'm in trouble because that's way down there. What what does he say? Oh, yes. Uh, Oh, okay. It's a correction. This post originally misidentified McCarthy's position at the time. Interesting. Okay. The infernal plan was to re, was to recast what was the largest outbreak of stateside political violence in memory as a just cause while transforming the insurrectionists into victims and martyrs. A little bit like they have been trying to do with the Civil War since forever, I would guess. By doing so, McCarthy would keep Trump and his movement safely in the Republican Party fold, ensuring the GOP electoral victories that could not be conceived of without their participation. I guess, i.e., including handing over control of the House of Representatives to Republicans, keeping it there, and making McCarthy speaker later on. Anyway, suffice it to say, the plan went awry. McCarthy was deposed by angry MAGA lawmakers regardless. The lionization of January 6th helped 
produce a historic COP midterm underperformance in 2022, and Trump will be the party's presidential nominee while facing January 6th related criminal charges that could help doom the party's 2024 hopes. All of which set the stage for Mike Johnson's groveling meeting with Trump at Pervalago Sex Dungeon on Friday. Sorry, Greg. Had to do it. Billed as an event about election integrity and or Russian adoptions, I would guess. Their press conference confirmed that the GOP remains as committed as ever to its disturbing post-insurrection path. It was a deeply weird affair, with Trump hovering watchfully over Johnson. The House Speaker said that in campaigning, he's discovered that people across the country just happen to be thoroughly obsessed with precisely the same thing that preoccupies Trump. I can't believe it. right? Everywhere we go, one of the first questions that people ask is this issue of election integrity, Johnson said, about which they have legislated zero, of course, but never mind that. It's notable that Johnson felt this would make Trump happy. The commentariat is often quick to judge Democrats for an obsession with January 6th. In the run-up to the midterms, it was suggested that voters didn't share their pro-democracy focus. Exit polls later revealed that, along with abortion, it was indeed an animating issue. But as Johnson demonstrated, Trump's GOP is the party that absolutely is consumed with hallucinations, nightmares, and fantasies about January 6th in a way that's verifiably politically damaging to them. Johnson and Trump also announced that the House will pursue a new bill requiring proof of citizenship to vote. Johnson even rattled off a convoluted theory in which non-citizens are threatening our elections by the, quote, design of President Biden, a soft version of the great replacement theory that has been mainstreamed at the highest levels of Republican and MAGA establishment power. There's no greater threat to our elections than Trump and his movement. And regardless, it's already illegal for non-citizens to vote. But this gesture has nothing to do with legislation. With it, Johnson publicly affirmed, with the same Pervalago shrine that McCarthy paid homage to as a backdrop, that the party remains fully committed to the myth that the 2020 election was stolen from Trump, here demonstrated by propping up the lie that our elections remain menaced by the same forces, parenthetically, fraudulent voters, many immigrants, that supposedly robbed Trump last time. It's worth noting why Johnson thinks this will help him. Johnson is at the moment in rather desperate need of Trump's support because he hopes to bring military aid to Ukraine to the floor, which Representative Murdery Trader Green may punish with a snap vote to oust Johnson. Appearing with Trump could strengthen Johnson's position, of course, but it's notable that he saw a potent way to make common cause with Trump in renewing his commitment to falsifying January 6th. And here's another measure of how deeply enthralled to that cause the GOP remains. By my count, at least a dozen Republican incumbents or prominent candidates in competitive races are tainted with election denialism some of it extremely serious or even deranged. These include representatives like Scott Perry of Pennsylvania, who was extensively involved in Trump's coup, Anna Paulina Luna of Florida, again, who co-wrote a children's book falsely depicting the 2020 election as stolen, and Derek Van Orden of Wisconsin, who attended the Capitol rally on January 6th. Meanwhile, GOP representatives Mike Garcia and Ken Calvert of California and David Schweikert of Arizona all voted not to certify Biden's electors. Representative Jen Kiggins of Virginia, I don't even know her, reportedly or rather repeatedly fed doubts about the 2020 outcome. Democrats view all these as key targets. Then, there are election-denying GOP candidates in other top-tier races, such as Scott Baugh, is it Baugh or Bow B-A-U-G-H, in California, who refused to acknowledge Biden's victory, 
Joe Kent in Washington State, who called for the rioters to be pardoned, and Myra Flores in Texas, who spread crackpot January 6th conspiracy theories. That's only a partial list. Could this factor help tip the balance of the House? It's not all that far-fetched a possibility. Dave Wasserman, senior editor and elections analyst at Cook Political Report, points to the Perry, Van Orden, and Kent contests as examples of races that might not be as competitive if those Republicans weren't severe election deniers. Wasserman also suggests keeping an eye on the GOP primary underway in the district of Representative Lauren Boebert, who is running in another district. That pits wild-eyed election denier Ron Hanks against a saner opponent. If Hanks wins, Democrats have a very good chance of winning Boebert's seat, Wasserman says. The upshot? As Wasserman notes, election denialism might end up mattering in only a limited number of races. But, he adds, the margin in the House is so close right now, can't get any closer, that even things like that could affect the outcome. Well, it could get a little closer. In three days, it does get closer. Anyway, it's easy to see how January 6th will become an issue in these contests. Reporters will surely, maybe, ask these election deniers how they'll conduct themselves on January 6th, 2025, which will come after the new Congress is sworn in. Would they vote to certify Biden's electors if he has defeated Trump and the latter has lost all efforts to litigate the outcome in court? That might not be so easy for these candidates to answer in the affirmative, given today's maga GOP, which treats election losses as illegitimate by definition. If Democrats are doing their jobs, they'll ensure that these Republicans are pressed to field this question. It's the ultimate tell that Trump himself also wants House GOP candidates subjected to this sort of January 6th related litmus test. Just before holding his presser with Johnson, Trump launched an attack on a sitting congressman, Dan Newhouse of Washington State, endorsing his MAGA primary opponent and slamming Newhouse as a weak and pathetic rhino. What, in Trump's estimation, makes Newhouse a Republican in name only? You guessed it. He voted to impeach Trump for the insurrection. House Republicans appear set to go into this fall's elections fully tethered to Trump, but also to his definition of the party, which requires that its commitment to historical myth-making about January 6th remain unquestioned and absolute. Well put and well summarized. Uh, and a good reminder, there are still, by the way, members hanging on who voted for the impeachment of Donald Trump, but they are few and far between and they are of course, constantly threatened by MAGA challengers. So, okay, let's see. We've got to open that up in another place so we remember to include it in our roundup. It is nearly break time, and if all is on schedule, we can check in with Joan and see what, uh, how she thinks things will go, perhaps in the Senate this week, and what priorities there will be, and, uh, you know, what other subjects might be on her mind? Let's see. Is there anything else that we could sneak in before the break? Probably, but uh, I don't know. Well, we'll see. How about this one? This is a weird one. Did, uh, let's see, who sent me this one? This may have been, um, well, th this is just a, a wild from way out in left field thing that probably came in via email and off the, I'll see if I can look up. Who sent it to me so that uh, we can credit it? But first, let me give you the story. All right, we'll do that after. That from the Daily Hampshire Gazette. This is interesting. Just, again, small time somebody somewhere, but accused Holyoke ex councillor Pueo Mota, if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, P U E L L O hyphen M O T A, bolts. Why? from where, ex-counselor from Holyoke, to join the Russian army. I mean, holy mackerel. Put that in your uh, political union with Russia to own the globalist file. Yeah, James Pentland is the staff writer who put this together for the Daily Hampshire Gazette. We'll just give you a taste of it before we roll our break music here. A one-term Holyoke city councilor 
I mean, used to be dedicated to, you know, upholding the Constitution and whatever, who appears to have decamped to fight with Russian forces in the Ukraine war to avoid having to register here as, well, he is a Republican. Why would he have to register here? Not register to run as a Holyoke counselor again, but rather register as a sex offender has, unsurprisingly, I don't know about unsurprisingly, become the focus of national and international media coverage. Wilmer Pueo Mota, 28, was due to change his plea to child porn possession oy, 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 and other charges in a Rhode Island court in January when his lawyer learned that he had left the country. Hi, everybody. It's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time. Just to tell you again, another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad. Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction and Whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure, recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself the gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't, or at least shouldn't, do it without you. Hope you'll be on board soon too. Thanks for all your support. All right, welcome back now, everyone, to the Gay Girl in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Joan McCarter joins us all the way from Portland. I'll get it right today. I don't know why. <laughs> you used to live in Seattle like years ago, right? Didn't right. you spend? Okay, so that's maybe where that came from. <laughs> I was like, uh... <laughs> Wrong city entirely. Come on. Yeah, close enough. Yeah, they're not that close. Uh, okay, well, all right. Well, at any rate, totally different state, maybe. No, yeah. Sorry, Oregon. <laughs> Didn't mean to, 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 to erase you from the map there. But okay, well, let's see. There's plenty happening. And uh, I don't know. This one I was just reading here has nothing to do with congressional happenings, but just one of the weirdest things. I do, I do want to credit Mark Hamill, not not – that other one, but the, a different Mark Hamill, who listens to the show. Maybe the original also listens to the show. Mark D. Hamill sent along that very weird story, uh, and it is uh, relatively local uh, to him, so that's how he spotted I hadn't heard about this guy, um, but I guess uh, – well, j just just to tell you, Joan. <laughs> in case oh, you didn't I hear, heard. You, I wow. Heard. This is pretty just, wild. So The, the Venn diagram. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sex offenders and Republicans, yeah, really pedophiles. Like I wasn't, yeah, is is something. Yes, it is remarkable how often this happens. And I, you know, my pet theory is that a lot of these guys are like, well, this is going to get me in trouble. This habit, this criminal habit of mine, is going to get me in trouble. And I think the best way to prolong my career as a criminal is to become a Republican politician because for some reason, I guess they still think, oh yeah, that's the last person they'll suspect of being a pedophile. Of course, that is now the first person I would suspect. <laughs> and anytime somebody says uh, if their child has been uh, abused, I would say, well, you know, uh, to me, I say, give me the voter file. <laughs> so yeah. I will find you your criminal. Give me the Republican voter file and uh, 15 minutes. And uh, if any of these names jump out of you as an elected official, start there. And anyway, this guy, yeah. So one term Holyoke counselor, local municipal uh, representative, not only a sex offender, 
not only a pedophile sex offender, but then decides the way to solve this problem is to flee the country, which really takes it to another level. But I guess if you're going to flee the country, flee to Russia. Oh, my God, that's even crazier. But not only that, flee to Russia to join the Russian army to fight in Ukraine. Wow. Well, I mean, I don't know what to tell you, but it's I, I guess when they say it's, it's not your lot. father's Republican <laughs> Party. <laughs> yeah. Well, what about that? It's, Peter I, Files who love Putin. Yeah, and who will fight in the Russian army. I mean, there's people who idolize strongmen, but very few who will then say, as an American, I feel it's important for me to fight in the Russian army. <laughs> uh, okay. Another Venn diagram for us. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so that's pretty crazy. Uh, look out for those guys, I guess. Meanwhile, here in the United States, uh, still no aid for Ukraine yet, but that's not exactly the same thing as fleeing as a convicted pedophile to fight in the Russian army. But apparently it's part of the progression. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> still no Ukraine aid, although there's kind of bizarre mm -hmm. movement toward it. Um, yes. We have another very complicated plan from Mike Johnson. <laughs> he loves you know, complicated how he, plans. Like how he made government funding more complicated than it needed to be with mm -hmm. his tiered system of of shutdowns. Yes, right. He has decided he is going to have four bills in a package. Hmm. Okay. Separate funding for Ukraine, separate funding for Israel, separate funding for Taiwan, and then a fourth bill that mm. somehow tries to create a rule that makes the Senate have to vote on, I'm not sure what, mm. <laughs> probably immigration. What's going to be in that fourth bill is still kind of up in the air, I guess. The hardliners are pushing for their HR2, their immigration bill. Uh -huh. Horrible one. And and Lord knows what. Um, Interesting. They are looking at a Friday vote for all of this. In the House? And in the, the this, House. Okay, so the House on the, on the aid. Okay, right. I'm, I'm, I'm they are supposed FISA to mode. be in recess next week. Including sure. the Senate. Why not? So, if, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is they, they, they might do four bills. I'm gonna get the hell out of here. <laughs> the Senate is doing the FISA bill. Yes, um, I don't think? know if you saw what their procedure was. No, I haven't. They did the middle of the night adjourn, re come back in so that the legislative, you know, the uh, legislative change the legislative day bring up the bill fast. Okay. It's a good one. A fake day break, like a page break inserted into a uh, needlessly into a Word document. You now have are in another legislative day so that they can get past the you have to wait X legislative days before you consider this bill, probably. Yes. Is that, OK. Yes. All yes. right. Got it. They, the, the deadline's Friday. It expires yeah. Friday. And it's Tuesday um, already. And you have the civil liberties bipartisan crew already pissed off about it as okay. they were in the house so yes I you did. will have both rand paul and ron wyden yes being not happy over the fact that warrants again are not in included for for domestic surveillance so mm -hmm. there's that okay um, and as you said there is also the presentation of impeachment articles today <laughs> they're doing it they're gonna so, go through with it okay what all this means is unless the Senate doesn't go into recess next week and if, and it's a big if, Johnson does manage to get this package through, um, Ukraine aid is, of course, delayed. So, yeah, again, still. Uh, what makes things more complicated, hmm. and I think you read the tweet early this morning that Massey has joined Green yes. as a co-sponsor for the motion to vacate. Yeah. yeah, okay, I did see that. And yeah. as of Friday, mm -hmm. Johnson has just one vote to spare. Right. Because that's when Gallagher leaves. <laughs> okay. So that, the, yeah, comes up again. The the Massey thing is about Ukraine. Um, 
Jim Jordan is raising hell about how he structured these four bills. Hmm. The Freedom Caucus is opposed to Ukraine aid. And apparently he, Johnson already added a wrinkle that he had not discussed with the White House, which was that he would allow amendments to that fourth. Well, amendments to all of it, apparently. Oh, okay. To all four of these packages, packaged bills. And when you say package, I mean, they're separate votes. They're separate bills that they, the fourth bill kind of pulls together. Sends to the Senate, apparently okay. trying to put some constrictions on what the Senate can do with it. <laughs> that must, they must Try. love that in the Senate. Uh, yeah. Ordinarily, they would be saying, well, the hell with that. But on top of that, like, I'm sorry, we're going to have our procedure handed to us by, by who? The guy who has right. no procedural control of his own house? Right. Okay. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I guess he um, does. Well, all right. I'll let you go. And obviously, you know, if, if, if Massey is on this motion you know what you're talking about. to vacate, and if Jim Jordan's raising hell about this vote and the whole Freedom Caucus is raising hell about hmm. aid to Ukraine, then the threat becomes a little bit more real for Johnson. Yeah. I mean, given that they've and, done it before. And also, because oh. Massey and, and the Freedom Caucus folks have the controlling block on the Rules Committee, he needs Democrats on the Rules Committee. To help him get this ah. out. He doesn't want to do it under suspension. Well, I told you how you could do it. he wants to allow amendments, so. Well, my, my plan, my crazy made-up plan was looking better. Mike Johnson, give me a call. Uh, you need more <laughs> Democrats on the Rules Committee? Put them there. We'll give you yeah. names. You yeah. know, move that resolution. Just uh, let's evenly split the Rules Committee and uh, put a couple more Dems on there. If you want... Put a majority of Dems on it, as a matter of fact. Go ahead. I, we won't object. Uh, I mean, as of now, Democrats are, you know, some of them are saying, yeah, 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 we'll help Johnson out. Just a mm. very few are saying we'll help him out on the, on the motion to vacate. But Jeffries is holding his cards very close to his chest. Good, yeah. Um, not should. making any promises and, in fact, has been working on consolidating support behind the motion to the, no no <laughs> motion 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 the petition the discharge petition okay um you got jared golden on it ah okay then again you you still though have the problem of the israel aid. yes sure and so will... in some ways splitting them up helps democrats it's not crazy you can help ukraine you don't have to vote for this blank check to Israel mm -hmm. or, you know, they could probably try to offer amendments, which the rules committee probably would not allow to say this aid now becomes conditional. Mm. Okay. Um, it, it, in a lot of ways, splitting them up makes sense. Yeah. For I Democrats think you're right. Too. Except for the time problem. Right. I mean, it's very inconvenient, but well, if he had done it earlier, that would have been more or less what eh, a lot of people were asking for. And people don't like uh, the packaging of it. Oh, I, I'm for this one, but I'm against that one. Creates a problem for you. So splitting it up, actually, you know, good from most members' perspectives, but passing four of them, I don't know. I know, although I guess it depends what this fourth bill is, how it's all going to work. If the fourth bill is a rule that somehow... I don't know. I mean, I, clearly they're not going to deem any of these things passed because they mean to separate them, but uh, okay, that's okay, a lot let's of time. see what it has in it. Okay. Um, the Repo Act, that's the um, take Russian assets and sell them and give the money to Ukraine. Okay. A TikTok ban <laughs> and <Sorry. laughs> loans to Ukraine. Ah, right. That's what's in it right now. Okay, so making oh, loans to Ukraine, TikTok ban. All right, that's I don't know how that really. It's a China thing in their view, and then uh, yeah. uh, the I Russian, already forgot the oh, Russian, Russian asset sell-off right. thing. Hmm. All right. Well, I mean, I guess that lumps in other things that people are upset about, but yeah, I don't. Yeah, it's not clear to me how it ties anything together, but I guess. 
rules committee yeah, you will know, be doing that. Trying, just trying to get as much Republican support behind three aid mm. bills as possible. Taiwan, that's not going to be an issue. People are going to vote for that one. Yeah. Um, All right. The other two, a problem. Okay. I feel like Taiwan so, is jealous and they want a problem just to get, <laughs> just to be more prominent. People should, yeah. you no, know, they want the money, I'm sure. It's an interesting way of structuring it. I, hmm. I was just considering way, way, way back in the day, back, back when you and back in the days when you and I actually worked on Capitol Hill. This is the sort of thing that the House might consider in one bill, but with a, a kind of rule that we haven't seen probably in like 30 years, various king slash queen of the hill rules. Yeah. Where you yeah. might say, I, you know, what, what goes in the final bill is determined on the floor. If you like yes. some aid for Taiwan, vote yes. If you'd like some aid for Israel, vote yes. On Apparently. Th they don't do that anymore. And, uh, you know, I just saw a, f a fleeting mention of it on, on Twitter or, or somewhere. Hmm. Pelosi did this in 2007 with Iraq. Oh. One of the uh, supplementals on Iraq. I don't remember quite the details of that. But, hmm. yeah, it's been since then, I think, that, that they've tried it. Um, okay. You mean, uh, tried the old style King of the Hill type thing yeah. or did what? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's entirely possible that, uh, well, the, the vast majority of the Republican conference has never seen anything like that. And no, the vast majority of the Republican conference doesn't know what their job is. Well, that's true. They haven't, they don't know what they've been doing now, much less what they used to do 30 years ago. Um, and I mean, if the same, if it has the same effect as uh, offering separate amendment votes on an omnibus bill, uh, I guess that won't bother them very much. And they can schedule all those votes in a single day. After all, they have a whole day dedicated, apparently, to uh, uh, protesting about appliances. Plans. Oh, that was going to be the whole week. <laughs> yeah, the whole week. Oh, I didn't realize that. that. So, yeah, infra yeah. home infrastructure week. Huh. Yeah, I, I caught wind of that. Liberating laundry or laundry. It's, I can't remember Liberty what it was. and laundry. Or, yeah, it they wasn't had about, you know. Something cute. <laughs> <laughs> Freeing your refrigerator. Yeah, yeah this right. This is going to be the whole week. <laughs> Refrigerator Freedom Act. I see your piece here. Liberty yes. and Laundry Act. I love the um, uh, Hands Off Our Home Appliances Act, as somebody Ooh, pointed I out. <laughs> exactly. That was terrific. What's all the hoo-ha? Well, I'll tell you. It used to be limited to just light bulbs. You can't make me change my light bulbs. And now it's everything. Gas stoves. When somebody said, hey, it's poisoning you. I don't care. Poison me. That's very MAGA. And then, yeah, everything else. It, uh, this is all stuff. I mean, I think they're angry about what? They think it costs more because people. it's energy efficient. Which means yeah. it ultimately costs less, but they don't yes. do that. They don't understand that. Plus, of course, it helps the environment. Boo! We want to hurt the environment because MAGA, and we liked it when there was acid rain and all the bald eagles were dead. We want to go back to that, oh, you know. And we don't want our woke appliances. Yeah, right. Now, I don't want AI in my appliances. I can't agree with that. Not that I need to ban yeah. it. But, right, like, I don't need an artificially intelligent, well, first of all, it's not even that. I don't need Wi-Fi in my That's life. for sure. Right. Did I start I the... do not want my refrigerator reporting to anybody No. what's in it. <laughs> right. Even me. So, right. Uh, I'll look if I need to know what's in there. It's one of my favorite activities. So <laughs> I don't need you to help me with that one. Plus, yeah, like that's all I need is right artificial intelligence in my appliance so that they finally become aware that I'm exploiting them. I, you know, <laughs> no, thank you. Don't teach my dishwasher that it could be, you know, free range. I don't need that. <laughs> I, I, that, well, that's just a dumb feature. But then, yeah, this is really all about making them efficient. And right. use less electricity, and that too is a no go Which, for Republicans. Don't tell me how much my refrigerator should use. Mm. 
if you don't want it. Um, well, and know. of course the the carbon based fuel producers, yes. energy so. producers, mm-hmm. right. which are probably not entirely missing in this calculation. I would guess not. We want, uh, you know, I guess the equivalent of a gas guzzler in a in a uh, in your laundry room means we get to sell you more electricity. Even if we produce it by solar, doesn't matter. We we get to charge you more because this thing gobbles more electricity. Why would you want that? I don't know. Um, and they don't. They and they don't know either. They just know that Democrats want things to be more efficient and save people money in the long run. So therefore, we can't have it. Because if that happens, they'll vote for Democrats. We don't want that. Mm-hmm. So. Damn interesting. And then, of course, uh, so that, that really handling the most picayune alongside, you know, world reordering events and not be, <laughs> and not not being able to do either of them. They were, it was bad enough that they've opened themselves up to enough ridicule that mm. they are spending a whole week on liberating our refrigerators. Right. But to do it now. Yeah. I, I don't know what they were thinking um, in, in scheduling that appliance week or this week overall. Mm, uh, I mean, ever. other than, you know, but, yeah. we're delaying Ukraine even further. Um, pretty much nuts. It. Yeah. They just, yeah, it's just, it's just they're super unserious and... They don't really have much else to go to. And yeah, what else can you pass by suspension anyway? So I, I guess that – and ordinarily, by the way, that, that at least is, is a bunch of bills that ordinarily would be suspension bills, yes. you would think. Uh, if they weren't – I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe if they're not super maga e, I I mean, some of them are so dumb and they, they set us back. I haven't really read the bills, and <laughs> to be honest, but maybe they wouldn't pass Jared by suspension. Mashowitz, the, the Democratic member, yeah, had wanted to propose an amendment to change the name of it all to the "Make Appliances Great Again." <laughs> <laughs> That's what they should be doing. Yeah, they should be happy about that idea. Yeah, uh, they probably vote for that one. Quite honestly, well, now whose idea was it? Moskowitz. Okay, is that his name? Uh, yeah, I just I do I was the like one who raises slipped. so much hell, and um, I think it's the oversight committee. Mm. It might be judiciary too, making no. making Comer look like an idiot. Yeah, well, which that's, isn't hard. No, uh, and that's a good thought. And uh, yeah, actually, I mean, he should hand that over to Jeffries. They should make it some sort of uh, uh, leadership backed motion. Say, I mean, just to delay in uh, uh, appliance week. No, they should all be renamed that. And who's going to vote against that? I'll tell Donald Trump you <laughs> voted against calling it MAGA. <laughs> then they wouldn't know what to do. And Trump would call in and say, yeah, sure, go ahead and do it. But it cost him another week. But wow. Well, this is uh, this is something. So they're jammed. They got to I mean, I imagine FISA has to take precedence, at least in the Senate. Where they're serious yeah. about something, they if they're going to do one and, thing before they leave, it's got to be breaking that. news. Closure yeah. is being filed today, so that would be a Thursday vote. Okay. Uh, oh, speaking of the breaking news, so as you were, we, back to the Mayorkas impeachment, which also is yes. going nowhere. Is are they definitely going to do that today? Are the has House managers uh, going over? Like, that's the story. Okay. I mean, that was the story last week too. Yeah, but- that's true. I was wondering, just musing, like, why? Well, first of all, why is Murdery Trader Green a manager? She got a role yeah. on one of the committees as government oversight, I guess, right? Did as they... oversight, yeah. She's okay. on oversight. So. Uh, is, like, uh, I was wondering, is... Speak... Well, and I think, you know, it may have been a, a leadership move to try to appease her. She was put on... Yeah. Uh, before her motion to vacate, stage. right. Well, that's what I was wondering. Like, uh, can yeah. can Speaker Johnson say? By the way, this motion to vacate is really not great for me. How about you're not a manager? When I make the list, I'm going to scratch out your name and put in somebody else's, even though you're all dressed up, probably waiting to go. 
I'm wondering whether she's wearing some protest outfit for this, knowing she'll be on C-SPAN. But can can he, I mean, he can just nominate someone else. I don't know whether that seals his fate or makes it better. But I was wondering whether he was waiting for her to do something even more embarrassing and then everyone would understand I, why he... I, he hasn't done it yet. He would have yeah. to do it very, very soon if he's going to. I guess, unless he delays sending the the impeachment again. I wondered whether the one week delay was, you know, somewhere in the next week she'll do something so embarrassing that I'll be justified in not naming her a a, a manager. Like, I don't know what they've been why they waited one more week, or I don't know why they I, waited two months. But I don't either. I don't either. Um, unless it was Republicans in the Senate asking them to, so that they mm. could spend more time grandstanding and raising hell and doing whatever it is. They're doing about yeah. it. Yeah, maybe. And now they've got themselves now. Oh, well, but we need to work on FISA. But yeah, the one thing the yeah. House can do to interrupt that is send them an impeachment. And then they, that, that throws everything into chaos. Yeah. So so I guess they're doing it. So we got to wait and uh, see. Apparently, as far as I know, it's still going to happen today. Um, okay. <laughs> which, what's, if what's interesting about it is that, you know, it's not all over the news. It's not all over Twitter. It's, yeah. you know. Because well, everybody knows this is not going to happen. And yeah, and it's been hanging out there, though, for so long. People are bored by it. Normally, it's a big deal on C-SPAN and, and somewhat interesting to watch, but that's because impeachment is normally a big deal, and this one big isn't. Big deal, yeah. Because uh, it's stupid. So how the Senate's probably going to handle it is just um, trying to send it to committee, probably. Yeah. I mean, they have to swear. Sure. In. They they do have to spend tomorrow dealing with it, um, swearing in the jurors. But they'll probably just vote to send it to committee, and and I think that they'll have Republican support to do it. It'll okay. be a simple majority. Yeah, maybe it works out well for them, and and ordinarily they might find more resistance among Republicans. But there are going to be Republicans anxious to reauthorize FISA, and that can't. Well, it'll be right. very difficult to do unless they shunt this thing immediately somewhere, even if it doesn't dismiss it. Well, let's get it out of the way so we can do FISA and they might get some votes for that. Probably. I mean, you I saw somewhere that Mike Lee was was making threats about um, holding all judicial nominees, well, all every nominee until uh, they have the impeachment trial. I don't know. Mm. You know, if that's really going to fly, if he's really going to do it, if he has support for it, I can't imagine anybody wanting to support Mike Lee. But, mm. you know, Tommy Tuberville, I'm not a Republican. Yeah, Tuberville. Yeah, I'll hold everybody for no reason. What the hell? Let's do it. Yeah, I'd, I'd hold every nominee to make them change salad dressings at the cafeteria if I could and can. But, uh, well, all right. So that's uh, that's what I I guess we'll anticipate that. And at some point, it'd be interesting to see a impeachment brought over with no pomp and circumstance. And I guess, well, judicial impeachments they don't cover this way. So uh, maybe they ignore this one and just just C-SPAN two all of a sudden is like, oh, there's some people from the house here, <laughs> as opposed to the big <laughs> the big march you get to see on C-SPAN one walking across the Capitol and then switches over to C-SPAN 2 when it moves onto the Senate floor. Um, I'm curious, like, uh, I forget now what the rules are for how, is there any limitation on how long, can the Senate limit how long they let the managers speak? Because otherwise, I mean, what? I don't know. I don't know what all of the rules are of yeah. impeachment are. You know, we should. We've yeah, been through I it know. twice in recent memory. Yeah, I feel like they usually have a procedural resolution of sorts about it, but they usually pass it after the the managers come and present their case, and maybe they give them an hour or something. But yeek, murdery trader green with time on the Senate floor. I don't know whether she actually gets any. I mean, she's not the lead manager, maybe only the lead. Ma we'll get to watch today, figure it out, and refresh our memories. And uh, then see how they do with getting around to the FISA stuff. Wow. Okay. Well, that is a full week. plate. Yeah. We'll, we'll see if it's a big enough week to make them cancel the next scheduled recess. <laughs> no way. Somebody's surely got dinner plans somewhere.
So, you know, and I'm not saying it's the same guy over and over again. I'm just saying, <laughs> yeah, making him cancel a recent, it has happened. It has happened. But, a full week. yeah, they come might. On. Come on, guys. Yeah. I don't know. They may think that doing FISA is legitimately enough to justify leaving. I guess there's no other things. Nothing else well, you know, there's falls off the, the map. Potentially, this this National Defense Foreign Aid Supplemental. Oh, yes. Potentially. Okay. I guess that's true. And if, uh, I don't know, the, the collapse of the prevailing world order hasn't moved them to cancel any other vacations before <laughs> but uh but yes now things are of course reaching uh the boiling point not only uh, ukraine running out of options but um, israel threatening to expand into wider war although they put the lid back on that one temporarily it might not be a great time to go i don't know let's say windsurfing <laughs> <laughs> to borrow another previous example Good caution, yes. Yes, okay. Though the winds are up, it is April, and, uh, you know, probably a good time for it otherwise if you have the flexibility. They don't, uh, but thank you for having the flexibility to join us today. We appreciate it. You are most welcome. And we'll see if we can check in again next week and uh, see whether they're still here and what they have and haven't taken care of on their way out the door. All well, right. But we'll see. Okay. It'll be a fun week in the meantime. Right. And, uh, and it, uh, hold on tight to all your appliances. <laughs> and assure them that they'll get through this. And uh, we'll check in with you again. Thanks, Joan. Take care. All right. All right time okay. now for us to hand things over to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Next, right here on Netroots Radio. From NetrootsRadio.com. You have been listening to Kegro. In the morning with David Waldman. All right, let's see what he's got on tap here. Here, the, the Department of Justice under Donald Trump served Trump's interests and his allies, and can still be seen in the structure of the New York criminal case against the Sleepy Don. Loved seeing him referred to as uh, what Don Snorleone. <laughs> that and much more from around the world. Stay tuned. <laughs>